the war in Ukraine has revealed something that wasn't unexpected, but whose scale and ramifications was a surprise. That is, the Russian capability of jamming and spoofing the GPS signal and the widespread impact this had on the Ukrainian war effort. In this video we will cover the events that we are referring to, some basic of the GPS and other global navigation satellite systems, how jamming is done and what are the countermeasures, and, most crucially, what are the real alternatives, which is something nobody is discussing, particularly in the public debate. But before jumping straight in, it I have arrived, to say... Sir. Otis, I'm recording, please. The kid has arrived. What? Is it here? You, wait, wait. You, you have to see this. You have to see this. This is my Heritage DNA testing kit, which is also the sponsor of this video. I always wanted to know more about my origins because I'm Italian, obviously, but some say that my surname is of Germanic origin. Moreover, my family's memory goes back two or three generations tops. With this DNA testing kit, you can have a breakdown of your ethnicity. Uh, this supports 42 of them and more than 2,000 geographic regions. And with my heritage, it's also possible to find relatives that you didn't know you had, but they can be found through the genetic affinity. It is really, really easy to use. Everything is in the kit. It's just a swab that you rub against the inside of your mouth, you put into a sample tube, and you mail to the laboratory. And my heritage takes privacy very, very seriously. They will never sell or license your genetic data. And this is the reason why I accepted them as sponsors. And now we have the results. And if you're wondering how it took just 20 seconds from me receiving the box and the results coming in, well, that's the magic of YouTube and the magic of my heritage. Okay, Otis, are you ready for this? I am curious as well, sir. Okay, I haven't seen the results, so I'm seeing them with you. Let's go. Augusto, you are 53 percent greek and south italian south Ita 22 percent spanish well could be portuguese also, but iberian and 18 percent well I, I think it means celtic and only five percent continental italian that's that's definitely unexpected. 53% Greek and South Italian. Otis, I can't believe that. Okay, let's see the DNA matches. A second cousin in France. That's unexpected as well. This is very interesting. I haven't processed it yet. And I honestly don't know how to process it. That was really unexpected. Anyway, if you have questions like the one I had, buy the MyHeritage DNA testing kit by hitting the link below or scanning the QR code on the screen. And don't forget to use the code Millennium7 at checkout for a free shipping offer. As usual, please support the people who support me. Several Western weapons relying on GPS guidance have been provided to Ukraine. Most of them encountered issues in a way or another. The Excalibur artillery round is a guided projectile compatible with standard NATO 155mm artillery. It is a relatively new weapon, having entered service in 2007. It is GPS guided, the range depends on the weapon firing it, but it has a circular error probability of 4 meters even at the far end of the ballistic range. For artillery units, it is considered sort of a silver bullet that can hit a point target with a single round. They have been provided to Ukraine in October 2022. The initial rate of success of the weapon was around 50%, or 70% according to other sources. But it fell down to 10-5% to in a few months, and by the summer of 2023, Ukrainians did not use it anymore. The complexity of preparing the round and the low success rate did not justify its employment on the battlefield. The HIMARS launchers, for a long time the darling of the pro-Ukrainian media, have gone through a similar arc. 
They, the first HIMARS launches were delivered in July 2022. The munitions delivered were mostly the M30 and M31 rockets, which feature GPS guidance. They have been very effective at the beginning and prompted an adaptation of Russian logistics. We all remember the damage on the Antonovsky Bridge where the missiles hit in a regular pattern every crater at the same distance from the next one, showing a great accuracy. But then, progressively, their effectiveness started to decline and today, albeit still useful, they are often jammed by the Russian electronic warfare or in many cases actually shot down by the Russian air defenses. The JDAM is a GPS-based guidance kit that can be added to a Mark 80 series iron bomb. The first deliveries date back to 1997, but the modern weapons have gone through a series of updates that make them more accurate and resistant to jamming. Ukraine has received the ER variant, which uses extensible wings to glide toward the target, reaching, in ideal conditions, a range of about 60 kilometers. And the same arc happened with these weapons, save for the fact that they did poorly since the beginning. And Ukraine has probably received the relatively modern weapons with combined inertial and GPS guidance, which mitigates the risk of GPS jamming and spoofing. However, falling back to inertial guidance is not a solution, like some very large YouTube channel wants you to believe, as we will see later. And it was even worse with the GLSDB. This is a ground launch variant of the small diameter gliding bomb GBU-39. The gliding munition is mounted on top of a rocket and it can be launched by the same HIMARS and M270 launchers that Ukraine is already using. It was deployed in Ukraine in February 2024, and this case was even worse. There are official declarations that said that it just didn't work because of GPS jamming and spoofing, but to be fair, also because of tactical deficiency. We have no news of its employment since, and no, if you listen to the press conference where this point emerged, it is clear that they are not speaking about the APKWS2, like some people say. To be fair, it seems that the air launch variant, which Ukraine has been given a small number, is doing well and it is retaining its accuracy, at least for the moment. Many say that the weapons given to Ukraine are old variants, the modern ones in use in the West are immune from jamming and spoofing. This is the objection that I keep hearing, but this is the sort of magical thinking that characterizes the mainstream media and those who don't have an open mind. No, many of them probably are not that old. The Excalibur is a middle-aged weapon, the GLSDB is brand new, and the other weapons that have been given, even if they are not the latest, they are still in service in large numbers. Since they are in service, they are supposed to be effective. So, some Western weapons relied heavily on GPS technology and it turned out to be very fragile. So, Houston, we have a problem. We often use the term GPS as if it was one thing, but it is not. The American Global Positioning System is only one of the global navigation satellite systems in use. There are six of them. The American GPS, the Russian GLONASS, the European Galileo, the Chinese Beidou, the Indian NAVIC, which is not covering the whole globe yet, and the Japanese QZSS, which is covering only the area around Japan. Conceptually, they're all the same. These are constellations of about 30 satellites in medium hertz and geosynchronous orbit. They emit signals that can be used by a ground receiver to identify its position in space in respect to a frame of reference centered on the center of the planet. A GNSS receiver is called a receiver because it doesn't emit anything. It is a passive device and it doesn't need a two-way communication with the satellites, as some erroneously believe. The implementations details vary quite a lot from system to system, and if you are that kind of nerd, there is a lot of fun to be had studying the differences. The principle, though, is always the same. The satellite transmits a signal that let the receiver do four things. Adjust its own clock, identify the satellite, which also means knowing the orbital parameters, 
identify the exact time of the signal transmission, identify the satellite position when the signal was transmitted. If the receiver has line of sight of at least three satellites, by comparing the difference in time of the signal arrivals and compensating for a number of annoying other factors, it is possible to calculate the position of the receiver in the frame of reference. On your phone, this position is normally expressed as latitude and longitude and plotted on a map. But the system actually gives you a three Cartesian coordinates, so it works in space too. It doesn't work underwater or underground because the, the signal is not penetrating, but if it did, it would work. This system broadcasts freely available signals and encrypted signals where the information transmitted by the satellites needs to be decrypted before being used. These are obviously for military use. In terms of accuracy, while a difference may be built in between the public and the encrypted signal, in practice it doesn't make much difference. In fact, using more than three satellites, the receivers can get to accuracies down to the meter level and below, which is enough for almost every application. Alternatively, a receiver may use more than one system and take full advantage of, in theory, all of the constellations to never miss the signal and increase the precision. This is more common than you think. Many of the phones you can buy on the market use two or more systems. The paradox is quite evident here. A GNSS is useful to you and to your enemy at the same time. If you want to cut your enemy off, you need to turn off the civilian signal, but this will create problems to your civilians, not to mention all those second line and rear guard military assets that use or repurpose the receivers, basically derived from the civilian market or just both on civilian market. Mind that now the GNSS signals are used in so many applications that denying access has unexpected ramifications. For example, in Ukraine, the Russian jamming of GPS signals disabled receivers that were used to synchronize the clock of the Ukrainian power network control systems. This made as much damage as actual destruction of assets, and it was a problem until non-satellite-based backup clocks were put in place. Some cellular networks use GPS signals for distributing the clock signal to the base stations, so jamming the GPS could crash your mobiles and basically your entire society with those. Which brings us to the next section. How do you jam the GPS? How do you defend from jamming? And how do you work around the defenses? There are two ways of interfering with GNSS systems, jamming and spoofing. The Russians do both, and they are very effective, as we have seen. Jamming the GPS signal is easy. It is a very weak signal, its average strength is around minus 127 dB millivolt. Anything transmitting a signal on the right frequency could jam it. It happens all the time, even in ordinary life, when the radio emitters produce accidental harmonics on the same frequency and drown the signal in the nearby area. You can also buy GPS jammers on the market, which are illegal, pretty much everywhere in the world, but, well, since there is a demand, there is an offer anyway. And these are used to neutralize vehicle tracker devices uh, used by companies or insurances. The Russian army uses the R330ZH Zetel system. This is usually deployed as part of the electronic warfare company assigned to brigade and division level units. It is a variant of the 330 family of systems which has been specifically designed to jam GNSS signals. It basically emits noise on the right frequencies and makes the GPS signal unreceivable. The system has a maximum emission power of about 10 kW, which means that considering the attenuation, if the emission is omnidirectional, the system could shut down the signal in a circular area of about 30 km. The antenna, though, seems to be made of different modules and it can probably operate directionally, and in this case, using the antenna again, the range would be even longer. This is not the only Russian system capable of jamming the GPS. Other systems can emit jamming signals in the same frequencies, 
and the 330Z can jam other frequencies. For example, it is not confirmed, but it seems that they cause issues at long range to the NATO AWACS radars covering the Black Sea. Russian electronic warfare systems are abundant and often with overlapping capabilities, so that the opponent is never really sure of what he is facing. In the context of the war in Ukraine, the electronic warfare branch of the Russian army has demonstrated remarkable effectiveness. GPS spoofing is a much more sophisticated technique. The spoofer system emits a signal mimicking the signal of an additional GPS satellite. Being usually closer than the satellite, it is easy to emit a strong signal that the receiver locks on. Then, emitting false position information, it is possible to induce an erroneous position indication on the receiver. If the position is used for guidance, then the guidance system will react to wrong inputs, and it will likely veer off course. So basically it is, the missile knows where it is because um, blah, 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 blah. Feel free to add the poem in the comments below because it's always nice. Some of you will object that an encrypted military signal cannot be spoofed because unless there has been a data breach, the opponent will not know how to encrypt the signal. Well, the GPS encryption, the so-called M-code, is not among the strongest, but even without decrypting it, you can still spoof the signal. It is enough to repeat the encrypted signal with high power, and the GPS receiver will find itself with the same signal from two different emitters, one much stronger than the other, and with different times of arrival. Guess which one the receiver is likely going to trust. Then, since the spoofer is not a satellite, the Position calculation will be thrown off, and the result will be, again, veering off course. It is also possible to record the signal, rebroadcast it with a 180 degree phase to cancel the authentic signal, and then emit the spoofing signal on top. In the best case, you will end up with a confused receiver, in the worst, with a completely fooled receiver. In the case of guided weapons, where the value of the weapon is in the accuracy, even a few additional meters error is a degradation such to make the weapon much less effective and potentially worthless. If the precision is not much higher than unguided munitions or hybrid system like the Russian Jefest, then there is no point in having a guided weapon. It becomes just an additional cost and complication. So it may seem that the GPS is outdated as a way to guide weapons, but this is not true. Obviously, there are ways to defend from this kind of attack. So, one solution is destroying the jammer. After all, it is an emitter and it can be located. But this is not what we are talking about. The United States have always been very aware of the GPS vulnerability. There have been several programs aimed at improving the GPS receiver resilience. For example, in the early 2000s, the JDAMs have been equipped with the SASM module, and all the JDAM acquired from 2004 onwards did feature the kit. It seems likely that the weapons provided to Ukraine were indeed equipped with the kit, but this did not eliminate the issue. And anyway, the GPS signal has some built-in resilience and it offers redundancy, but as we have seen, is it is not enough. So, one obvious measure is using different GNSS systems. It is obvious that the US systems use the GPS by default, but multi-constellation receivers are commonplace in the civilian market, and there is no reason not to do the same. And in fact, they do. For example, the F-35G NSS implementation uses GPS and Galileo. In theory, you could also use the opponent's GNSS because they will never jam their own systems, do they? Well, the Russians often jam indiscriminately when they do, just to stay on the safe side. Directional jamming may be used, but there is no way of discriminating between a friend and a foe in the affected area. Moreover, many of the GNSS have overlapping frequencies, so if you jam one, you jam many of them. And in principle, if you can jam one, there's nothing preventing you to jam the others. Another interesting approach is using a high-altitude drone or aircraft as a friendly GPS emitter, emitting a high-power GPS signal to feed your own systems and overcome the jamming. 
This is perfectly doable in principle, but the receiver must be capable of calculating the non-Keplerian motion of the aircraft. Again, doable in several ways, but there are plenty of assets in service that would not be capable of using that signal correctly, and you will be self-spoofing your forces. If a military organization goes down this route, then they need to be sure that most of the receivers in use can handle this situation. Going down the same route, you could add more satellites in lower orbits, making the signal stronger in any given point. Uh, this could be an interesting solution, but the lower the satellites, the more exposed they are to anti-satellite interceptors. Moreover, the area covered by each individual satellite will be much smaller, so you really need a lot of them. With the obvious drawback that any low art orbit satellite mega constellation is basically a Kessler syndrome waiting to happen. I always thought that the best course of action for a superpower would be to try to be as independent from space based assets as possible, and then, in the initial stages of a conflict, start swatting satellites with the purpose of denying access to space by saturating the low art orbits with debris. You may also start developing hardened satellites that could absorb small debris impact to keep some assets in space for some time. However, I am digressing. Another way of hardening a receiver is making the consideration that the jammer is on the ground, but the satellite is in space. So just consider signals that are coming from above. True, you can build directional antennas that point upwards and you can gain 30 or 40 dBs of signal to jam ratio. But this is not a definitive solution because every antenna has lateral lobes where the signal can infiltrate into. You are just reducing the jammer's range. Moreover, it works only if it is mounted on something that keeps its orientation more or less constant, and it also reduces the fraction of sky visible by the receiver, reducing the number of satellites that can be used and potentially the accuracy. It is generally not a problem, but if the satellites start becoming attacked, it may become relevant. I also believe it that it is possible to build a mechanically steered directional antenna that could be pointed away from the jamming source, but it seems a an overly complex solution with potential mechanical reliability issues, and I don't know if it was ever implemented anywhere. All these solutions that try to reduce the power received from the jamming signal or increase the power of the GNSS signal are only mitigations. They reduce the range of the jammer, but they do not remove the jamming entirely. For example, if you are attacking a target in the vicinity of the jammer, in the last few seconds of the trajectory, the jamming may still happen. The actual performance is obviously classified, but some sources say that in the case of a JDAM, every second without guidance adds a meter to the circular error probability, which is already 4 or 5 meters on its own. You understand that even just 5 to 10 seconds without guidance may add up quickly and become relevant. Combining GNSS with inertial guidance could help mitigating this last mile problem. However, it is not a general solution like someone would like to say, that is just the difference between the bathroom window and the bedroom window. Inertial navigation is not suited for precision weapons, even at moderate ranges. And if you don't believe me, you should ask yourself why there are no long-range precision weapons that relies exclusively on inertial guidance. Protecting from spoofing is, in a way, simpler, but also in another way more complex. In fact, the spoofing signal is received and processed, unlike with jamming, where the signal is drowned into noise. Being the signal processed, it is possible to apply some logic to try and see if you can distinguish a spoofing signal from an authentic signal. For example, using two or more separate antennas, it is possible to work out from the received signal phases the direction where the signal is coming from. If it is coming from the enemy's side, then you may want to ignore it. If it is coming from below, it is a spoofing signal, not a satellite. If the signal is a duplicate of another signal, then it is not an authentic signal, and probably the stronger is the false one, but you are never sure. So, spoofing is much more complicated than jamming, but the defender has a way of defending from it. The problem is that the logic and the antennas required to identify a spoofing signal make the receiver more complex and expensive. 
it's doable, it is done in some cases, but there is no alternative. The fact that spoofing exists adds another variable to an already overly complex landscape. So this is another episode of the eternal battle of action against reaction. While the GNSS navigation cannot be made completely safe, it can be effectively protected and the effects of jamming and spoofing can be mitigated. Moreover, it is not possible to jam everything everywhere all the times because this influences friendly forces too. And you really need a lot of assets to do so. This is the typical case where one technology is making another less effective and neither has the upper hand. The problem is, though, that there is a cosmic amount of hardware that relies on old or civilian-derived GNSS receivers that need to be hardened. And even civilian receivers need a degree of hardening because losing them may cause societal issues that may not be tolerable. And this is going to take time and money. So all of this is well and good, but what are the alternatives? As we have seen, there is no complete solution to this problem, so what kind of navigation could we use to replace the GPS? And by the way, all the things we are going to discuss now are real, that is, are real options being assessed by research teams. The term they use is old PNT, that is alternative positioning, navigation and timing. One of the most attainable possibilities is to add PNT signals to RF signals that exist already. Data links, for example, are a good candidate. However, there must be still a reference emitter that knows its exact position on the data link network. There are currently developments to extend the Link 16 in space, thus relying on satellites that could double as positioning systems. But the jamming of a data link is still an option. Another possibility is using signals of opportunity, cellular towers, radio and TV. This could be used for position and extracting clocks, depending on the specific signal. However, it is still radio frequency signals, in some respects even easier to jam than the GPS. These signals are also easy to fake, while the encrypted GPS is easily verifiable. A different approach is using gravity and inertia. In fact, inertial navigation is quite an old approach and the threat to GPS have brought to new research to make inertial navigation better. However, it is physically impossible to eliminate the drift, that is the cumulative error of position as the inertial unit is moving and it is unlikely that this will ever reach the level of accuracy allowed by GPS. Moreover, it doesn't provide a clock signal itself. Another approach that has been in use for several decades and it is now being revived is using ground elevation or bathymetry. Cruise missiles use radar altimeters to navigate, matching returned signals with an onboard elevation map. The same could be done with sonar on water, however this requires accurate mapping, preventive mapping, and the mapping on land may get old quite quickly due to the action of man. Moreover, it is not a passive navigation, particularly in the case of sonar, but it could be quite accurate. However, no clock signal in this case too. Another proposal is reviving celestial navigation based on stars, the moon, the sun, and so on. This is an extremely old approach, and automated celestial navigations had some applications in the 50s and the 60s. It could be quite accurate and it is unjammable. We may expect it to become even better if re-implemented with modern technology. The drawback is its sensitivity to atmospheric conditions since it should work mostly in the optical window. In this case, some exact timing information should be possible but not at constant frequencies. A science fiction-like approach is using crustal magnetics. They, they call it like this, just one word. When the rocks form either emerging from the mantle in the middle of the oceanic ridges or by volcanic activity on the continents, they solidify, obviously. <laughs> During this process, their components lock inside a trace of the planet's magnetic field at the time of the rock formation. If these fossil magnetic fields could be accurately mapped and detected, they would provide a reference grid that could be used for navigation. This approach works on land and sea, it is passive and it is unjammable. It is still unclear how accurate it could be or how much the human activity could interfere with this kind of magnetic navigation. Once again though, 
no clock signal. So these are really exotic solutions, but the most likely line of evolution will be a combination of different technologies in order to reduce the dependency on the GPS and mitigate its outages. And this means that complexity, costs, resource intensity, and so on will increase. Considering the diffusion of the GPS, everything and everyone will be effective. So we have interesting times ahead. So thank you very much for getting this far into the video. It was a honor and a pleasure having had your attention. A big thank you to MyHeritage for sponsoring this video. Please take advantage of the offer we have by clicking the link in the description and using the code MILLENNIUM7 at checkout for free shipping. Please support the people who support me. And an enormous heartfelt thank you goes to all the channel supporters on Patreon or by being a member. You are absolute stars. You are absolutely essential. Please consider if you could become a channel supporter too. I would be incredibly grateful. So this is the end. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Go, go, go.